If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died. Yes, rather, he who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who intercedes for us, who shall separate us from the love of God in Christ, shall tribulation or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword. In all these things we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Father, you gave your own son. How will you not also freely give us all things? If you could do the harder thing, you could certainly do the easier thing. And we know that your ways are not our ways. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so high are your thoughts above our thoughts. But thank you, even when we don't know how to praise, we ought that the Spirit intercedes with groanings too deep for words. Many are sick in our congregation, a number with severe cancer. Pray for Deb as she sits up there in the high deck. Pray for Rick Forstner with his now brain cancer. Lord Jesus, might you be gracious. We know that the days were ordained even before there was yet one were all recorded in your book. And yet we know that Very often, you regulate those days on the prayers of your people from eternity past. And so we come in humility this morning, looking for you to feed our souls, looking for the Spirit of God to meet us. I pray for his filling upon my life, that I might lift up the Lord Jesus in all of his preciousness and glory. May you use this message until Christ comes again for all who will hear it and for the meeting this afternoon with potentially over 100 youth, we ask your grace upon it that you would allow me to speak with clarity. Thank you in advance for what you will do and we thank you in Jesus' holy name, amen. Take God's word with you this morning, turn to the book of Hebrews chapter 11. We just completed a series called God's Prophetic Schedule And God willing, in late summer, we will begin a brand new book of the Bible where we typically go through chapter by chapter and verse by verse. But there are a number of things that people have asked me about and a number of things that God has just put on my heart to preach. And so as you can see, the message this morning is the power in the blood. Perhaps two of the greatest evangelists known to us in our day would be Dr. Billy Graham and Dwight L. Moody. Both of these men shared a common trait, and they were criticized particularly for their preaching about the blood. When Billy Graham was getting started and God was using him mightily, a professor from Cornell University wrote this letter to him, and I quote, Mr. Graham, you have great talent. You have what it takes to be a successful minister. But if you want to continue to be successful, you are going to have to leave out that preaching on the blood. It is out of date and no enlightened man will swallow it. Likewise, Dwight Lyman Moody started preaching, and a woman wrote him, quote, Brother Moody, if you want to be effective, you are going to have to leave out all that stuff about the blood. To which Moody wrote, I was from that day on determined to preach more about the blood of Christ than ever before. And thank God that neither Moody nor Graham ever compromised. They never allowed their critics to dissuade them And if you don't understand how central the blood of Christ is to the message we preach, I hope you'll be convinced before we are today. Not only are we a people of the book, we are a people of the blood. And thank God for every precious drop of blood that Jesus shed on our behalf. Hebrews 11, many titles given to this chapter. Some call it the faith chapter. Some call it the honor roll of Old Testament saints. Some call it the heroes of the faith. Perhaps my favorite is God's hall of fame of faith. And this chapter is filled with men and women who distinguish themselves 
in his side on the basis of their faith. Now, we're going to focus largely on one verse from this chapter, Hebrews 11 and verse 4, but to give us a running start, I want to begin reading in verse 1, so follow along. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen, for by it the people of old gained approval. By faith we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of the things which are visible. By faith, Abel offered to God a better sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained the testimony that he was righteous, God testifying about his gifts, and through faith, though he is dead, he still speaks. You know, have you ever read the Bible and wondered why it is so biographical? All the way through Scripture, there are sometimes large portions of Scripture that are given to a particular individual, and the reason is because the Spirit of God loves to teach real-life experiences through flesh and blood people. In speaking of the Lord Jesus himself, John wrote in his prologue that he became flesh and dwelt among us. He literally, the Greek text says he he tabernacled among us. He he pitched his tent among us. And we beheld his glory, glories of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. And so God loves to teach through real life examples. When I study people like Abraham or Moses or Barnabas or Paul, or in this case, Abel, I'm always challenged because God uses the lives of godly individuals to teach us how to live and how to believe God as they believe God. Now, in the original context of this book, this chapter is written, remember, to Hebrew Christians. These were Jewish men and women who had believed Jesus was indeed and is indeed the Messiah. And because of that, they experienced much, much persecution. And so the Spirit of God writes this letter through the writer. We know who it's not. We know it was not Paul. We know it was certainly not an apostle. We don't know the writer. As I highlighted recently on a Wednesday night, we know that the readers knew who it were, but um, we don't know. And, And I suppose God in his wisdom allowed that to happen because Jesus is the hero of this book. He is the one who is exalted and lifted up above all else. And it's interesting, he wants to encourage them, he wants them to live a by faith kind of life. Now what's interesting is before you come to chapter 12 where he begins to give all of these exhortations as to how we should live, he precedes it with chapter 11. Look at the end of chapter 10 for a moment, Hebrews 10 and verse 38, it's across the page for many of you. But my righteous one will live by faith And if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. He's quoting the book of Habakkuk. My righteous one shall live by faith. And so the lifestyle of the saved person is a by faith kind of lifestyle. Not only does God save us by faith in Christ, he wants us to live by faith moment by moment by moment. And so before he goes directly into us putting it in the shoe leather, he wants to encourage us here in this 11th chapter. And he wants us to know that whatever age you live in, you can live by faith. To demonstrate that, he dips back into five time periods in Israel's history. If you were with us in a recent message, I gave you those, maybe you missed them. He gives 17 named examples of men and women who believe God and countless unnamed examples And each person in each age, each time, believed God for what they needed him to believe. He starts in verses four through seven. Some of you have it out in the margin. The primeval period. The primeval period. God had yet not established the nation of Israel. That starts in Genesis 12, of course. But he's laying the groundwork and the structure for that to take place. And so this period of time describes Genesis chapters one through 11 before Israel is founded through Abraham in the 12th chapter. And he highlights three men to illustrate this particular time, Abel, Enoch, and Noah. Then secondly, in verses 8 to 22, some of you still have in the margin the patriarchal period. And there he deals with the patriarchs, the founders of the nation, beginning with Abraham, including Jacob and his 12 sons, so to speak. There's a total of 15 patriarchs, but only four make it into the pages of this hall of fame of faith, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. The third period in verses 23 through 29 is typically referred to as the period of the Exodus. 
and it's represented by Moses and his parents, but Moses, of course, is the one who is highlighted because he was willing to give up the passing pleasures of sin to live a by-faith kind of life. And then the fourth period in verses 30 and 31 is the period of the conquest. And the focus here is on Israel conquering the promised land as they watch the walls of Jericho fall. And they see a, a prostitute who also falls in her heart in that she, by faith, repents of her sin and believes in the one true God of Israel. The fifth period is the period of the judges and the kings. That's found in verses 32 through 38. And again, God is underscoring in every period of time, even today, it's the by faith kind of life that pleases him. So that's the broad in the immediate context. So we're in the first period that the writer highlights. The very first human that God ever writes about here in this 11th chapter who lived a by faith kind of life was a gentleman by the name of Abel. And many of you know that not only did Abel suffer for his faith, he paid the ultimate price. He was murdered because of his faith. So what was it about this man's faith that was special, unique, that allowed him to be included by name in God's hall of fame of faith. There are three expressions of his faith I don't want you to miss. First, there in your note-taking outline, what Abel sacrificed in faith. What Abel sacrificed in faith. If you're new, there's a note-taking outline in your bulletin. If you're viewing us somewhere in the world today, you can download it and print it out. What Abel sacrificed in faith. Notice how verse four begins. By faith, Abel offered to God a better sacrifice than Cain. Now remember, he's writing to Hebrews. He's writing to Jewish believers who are well acquainted with the Old Testament. The reason chapter 11 is so challenging for so many Christians today is we don't know our Old Testament. So with that in mind, hold your finger here and turn to the book of Genesis chapter four. They have a knowledge of these events that maybe some of us don't have. But through Abel, we are introduced to two means of salvation, two methods of service, and two different approaches to God. We'll see today that there's God's way, the way of faith. And we'll see there's another way, not based on what God has revealed, but based on man's way of thinking. And twice over in the book of Proverbs, we're told there's a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof is the way of death. It may seem right and logical that man's way works, but it doesn't. And so one leads to life, the other leads to death. Now, here in Genesis 4, I want you to see the original context in which the writer of the Hebrews is giving divine commentary on. He describes, in essence, two children that are born to Adam and Eve. One represents true religion that's pleasing to God. The other represents false religion that's displeasing to God. And the chapter instructs us that there's a right way to worship God and there's a wrong way to worship God. In fact, when Jesus spoke to the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman, he said, God is spirit and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. In other words, you can't worship God however you think you should worship him. You must worship him in spirit and in truth. And all truth is found here in scripture. So both of these brothers came to worship God, and one came rightly, and today he's in heaven. The other came in the wrong way, and this morning he is in Hades, current day hell. And what they sacrificed and how they sacrificed and the spirit in which they sacrificed is very important, and I don't want you to miss it. Now, it's interesting because outwardly, I'm sure they both came with a deep sense of sincerity. I've spoken many times to people in the Christian science denomination because they were born and rooted in New England right across the street from where I went to college. Boston College was the headquarters, so to speak, of Mary Baker Eddy. Her mansion was there. Of course, Christian science is neither Christian nor scientific, but I was speaking to someone in that religion, and they were very sincere about the things they were saying. And I reminded him, it's possible to be sincere, but sincerely wrong. And so they're both no doubt sincere in their approach to God, but one is, pleased, one is pleasing to the Lord, the other is displeasing. So three aspects of Abel's sacrifice by which God can commend him. First point A on your outline, the nature of Abel's sacrifice. The nature of Abel's sacrifice. Notice how Genesis 4 and verse Uh, One, how the chapter opens. Now the man had relations with his wife. 
the man, Adam, had relations. Literally, the Hebrew says, Adam knew his wife. And this is the first time they had a physical relationship together, which is a major clue to us that the period of time that Adam and Eve lived before the fall was probably a short period of time. And she conceived, we're told, and gave birth to Cain. And she said, I've gotten a man-child with the help of the Lord. So Eve rightly acknowledged that God opens the womb. People don't believe that anymore. They think, well, we're the author of children. We're going to have a baby in March of 2028. That's blasphemous to God. God is the one who opens the womb. And many Christians are infertile because they are not acknowledging that. They think they're in control. There are many other reasons. One of the huge reasons today people can't have babies, you know, the, the ability to conceive is grossly dropping. It's because of the use of alcohol in our nation. It's short-circuiting a man's ability to be as fertile as he could be. There are many reasons. And some people can never have a baby just simply because God has a different plan for them. But she gave, again in verse 2, birth to his brother. And again, she gave birth to his brother, Abel. And this Hebrew phrase, and again, indicates a steady progression of events. In other words, between these two boys, there's a short period of time. We don't know exactly how long, but it's a short period of time. And no doubt they had happy family times. They probably sat around the campfire at night and Adam told them about how God had given him the responsibility to name the animals and how God put him to sleep and took one of his ribs and created their mother. And perhaps he told them how sin had gone into, come into the world and what had happened. And maybe he even took them to the Garden of Eden and showed them the flaming sword and the two cherubim that were still there prior to the flood and warned them, don't ever, ever go in there. And no doubt they had happy times, and no doubt these two boys had squabbles because the sin nature was being passed on. Nonetheless, we're told further in verse 2, and Abel was a keeper of the flocks, but Cain a tiller of the ground. Don't miss that. One was a rancher, one herded sheep, the other was a farmer. And as we're going to see in a moment, these two boys were well taught by their parents. They knew much about the Lord. They knew that sin was an offense to God, that sin brought death. They knew that God could not be approached flippantly. They knew that you just don't barge into the presence of God, that he needs to be approached on his terms as you worship him. But in spite of all they knew, notice verse 3. So it came about in the course of time that Cain brought an offering to the Lord of the fruit of the ground. Now please do not forget, right after the Lord sentenced Adam, he cursed the ground. Listen to these words from Genesis 3:17. Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree about which I commanded you, saying, you shall not eat from it, cursed is the ground because of you. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. So Cain, like Adam, was going to have to work the ground. It was no longer going to be effortless farming where things just blossomed and bloomed. He had to work hard, and there's no doubt that he did work hard, and there's no reason to believe he was anything but a good farmer. I imagine that when he brought his offering to the Lord, he brought the best herbs, the best fruit, the best vegetables, the best flowers, and he probably spread them out before the Lord and said, here, Lord, here's your offering. And I'm sure it was beautiful, and he thought, no doubt, that God was pleased with it. How do we know that? Because of his response, as we'll see in a moment, and God certainly was not pleased with it because he tells us in verse 5, but for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. God had no regard for it. He would not receive it. Uh, no favor you could render the Hebrew. No respect. God was not pleased with the offering. God turned his back on the offering. It was nauseous to God. By contrast, here in verse 4 we read, And Abel, on his part, also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of their fat portions, and the Lord had regard for Abel and for his offering. Now question, why did God accept Abel's offering and reject Cain's? Why did one offering please the Lord and the other displease him? For the simple reason that one came in faith and the other came in unbelief. One came in faith. God had revealed without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness. And the other came based on human reasoning. He had jettisoned what God had already revealed and believed what he thought in his mind was right. 
In the New Testament, we read in Hebrews 9 and verse 22, and without shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Absolutely, undeniably, unequivocally, emphatically, without shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness, none whatsoever. Have you ever heard the expression, you can't get blood out of a turnip? Perhaps maybe they got it from this text. Perhaps uh, he brought a turnip. But God was displeased what he brought because God had revealed without the shedding of blood, there's absolutely no forgiveness. Now, if you've ever taken a course on comparative religions, man has a way of dividing up the religions of the world. They'll say, well, there's Buddhism and Confucianism and Mohammedism and Hinduism and Judaism. And and then there's, of course, Christianity. And then we further subdivide Christianity. We say, well, there's Baptists and Lutherans and Pentecostals and Episcopalians and Anglicans and Roman Catholics and the Church of Christ and disciples of Christ. And, but in God's eyes, there's only two divisions. There is the religion of works and the religion of grace. There is a salvation that is based on man's human merit and there is the religion that is based on God's divine revelation based on blood. There is the way of the cane, and there's the way of the cross. It's interesting, when you come nearly to the end of the Bible, you find the book of Jude. It's just one chapter. And what Jude is, um, what, what the book of Acts is to the apostles, the book of Jude is to the apostates. The book of Acts records the Acts of the Apostles. The book of Jude, the only book in all the New Testament that is dedicated to apostasy, records the Acts of the Apostates. And listen to what we read. You might want to put in the margin next to verse 5, Jude 11. If you're new to the Bible, we don't usually say Jude 1, colon 11, because there's just one chapter. There's a few books like that. So we just say Jude 11, not Jude chapter 11. And we read here, Woe to them, for they have gone the way of Cain. And what is the way of Cain? The way of Cain is religious religion, bloodless religion that's based on human effort. Cain represents salvation through good works when a person tries to earn his way to heaven by all the good things that he does. And of course, the idea did not originate in the mind of God. It originated in the mind of man. It was not based on divine revelation. It was based on human reasoning. People often say, well, I'm looking for a religion that suits me. I'm looking for a church that I like. I'm looking for a religion that I'm comfortable with. What you should be looking for is a religion that suits God, a religion that is pleasing to God. You're not here to worship yourself. You are here to worship the living God based on the prescripts that he has given. And so Cain here is a picture of man-made religion, of man trying to, by his own efforts, please God. And I'm sure maybe artistically it was beautiful as he laid it all out in the presence of God. And by contrast, Abel, it was a, it was a bloody mess. But God was pleased with the out, one and rejected the other. And there are many people today that are still trying to earn their acceptance with God. They appeal to their baptism. They appeal to their caring for the hungry. They appeal to their golden rule, their confirmation, their baptismal certificate instead of going God's way. Paul will write this to the church at Galatia. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died needlessly. That is to say, if you are saved in some way, shape, or form, and if you know that book, they weren't adding 50 works or 1,000 works, but one work. If you're saved by any works, then you invalidate the cross of Christ. God was an absolute fool to have given his son to die on a cross if it were unnecessary. But God was no fool. He knew apart from the preciousness of Christ's sinless blood, from the blood of God as it's referred to in the book of Acts chapter 20, verse 28. You say, I didn't know God had blood. He did when he walked on the earth. Understand it was not the blood of Mary that was coursing through the veins of the Lord Jesus. When a woman carries a baby in her womb, the blood system of the baby is distinctly different from the blood system of the mother. Had Jesus had Mary's blood in her veins, he would have the blood of Adam and he could atone for no one's sin. He was sired by God the Holy Spirit. And so in paternity suits, they often would look in ages past, now we have DNA in more sophisticated ways, 
but they would look to see what blood type the baby had and what the blood type of the father might be. In either case, God was no fool. God himself, God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself. God himself shed the sinless, precious blood of Christ. God was no fool. He knows you're not saved by human effort. So there's two ways. There's the way of the cross and the way of Cain. Now, what I'm wanting you to see is that he came by faith, Abel, based on what God had revealed about the shedding of blood. You say, well, wait a minute, Pastor, wait a minute. I've heard this interpreted differently in the past. I've heard it say that other preach, by other preachers that the blood atonement wasn't even in view here. I've heard it say that it was simply the attitude in Abel's heart that he came in faith and came, Cain came in unbelief and that was the basis by which God accepted one and rejected the other. Now that way of thinking, by the way, came out of 19th century German theology. Now, the German church gave us some great theology. They gave us many, many good things. Some of the great Protestant reformers came out of Germany, but they eventually went liberal and began to teach untruths. And sadly, there are Christians, some conservative commentators, who think that's what's in view here, and I'm going to prove to you that's impossible. It's argued that Abel's offering was rejected because, or Cain's offering was rejected because he brought the fruit of the ground. Whereas Abel brought something else. Now remember, we just read in Genesis 3.17, God said, cursed is the ground because of you. And therefore, it is argued based on the origin of the offering that God accepted one offering and not the other. The only problem with that is God teaches not only was the ground cursed, all of creation was cursed. Listen to these words in Romans chapter 8. The apostle Paul will write for the creation was subjected to futility, not of its own will, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself also will be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. And so the Bible is clear that all of creation has been affected by sin. Well, other people argue, well, clearly that can't be in view in light of the fact that it's not just the ground that's cursed, but all of creation, that what's in view here is not the origin of the offering, but the quality of the offering. Uh, The Orthodox Jewish Bible, which they call the Tanakh, uh, underscores the quality that is brought out in Hebrews 11 and verse 4. Uh, Let me read it to you. And Abel, for his part, brought the choicest of the firstlings of his flock. The Lord paid heed to Abel in his offerings. And so they argue that since Abel brought the firstlings, that is the best, that's what's underscored in the Hebrew text, that God was pleased. The NAS renders it here. And Abel, on his part, also brought the firstlings of his flock and of their fat portions. So certainly there is a quality that he brings here. The Hebrew noun bakram that's rendered first slings underscores that. And when it's added with the the fat portions, and the fat portions were important. If you read Leviticus 3, Leviticus 7, they would burn the fat of the offering and it would arise up to God, so to speak, as a fragrant aroma a soothing aroma. So from a human standpoint, the offering of Cain was no doubt more aesthetically pleasing where Abel's offering was a bloody mess. But it's reasoned based on the quality of the offering that Abel brought his best and Cain brought less than his best and therefore God received one and not the other. Two major flaws in that interpretation. Number one, it's an argument from silence. That's an inference. It assumes that Cain did not bring his best. It reads into the text something that is not explicitly said. We call that eisegesis. I hear a lot of eisegesis from pulpits today. We are not to read into the text what is not explicitly said. We're to read out what God has written. And so that's an argument from silence. Second, let's just say for the sake of argument, that if Abel knew that God demanded a blood atonement for sin, and he did, but let's say he knew that, and at this point, um, uh, he brought uh, an offering that was less than best, 
versus Cain. Let's say Cain knew it too. Let's just, let, let's broaden it here a little bit. Let's say Cain knew that there was a need for a blood offering. Let's say he brought a blood offering. He didn't. He brought the fruit of his hands, but suppose he did. And Abel brought one. Even if he brought one, some would say uh, Cain's offering would have been better because he brought the firstlings. In other words, he didn't bring some crippled, lame, mangy kind of lamb. He brought the best. And of course, Scripture underscored the need for that. That's why Jesus comes into Jerusalem before he's crucified on what day? Palm Sunday. And for the next several days, he's examined by all the religious leaders. And through all the religious uh, uh, inquiry and trials, so to speak, that he faces, he comes out clean and innocent. And on that same day on Palm Sunday, what did the shepherds from Bethlehem do? They brought those sheep in through the sheep's gate. And all week long, the sheep would, would be carefully examined. And, and those that had scars or uh, some deformed limb or some scab on them would be rejected because for the lamb to be pleasing to the Lord as an offering, it had to represent an unblemished offering. And so some would say, well, you know, Abel brought his best and Cain brought less than best. But of course, Cain didn't bring a blood offering. Cain brought the works of his own hands. And he thought that was acceptable. How do we know he thought that was acceptable? Because he became angry. Remember, the best interpreter of Scripture is Scripture itself. And a careful exegesis of the passage demonstrates that Cain had expected his offering to be accepted. Why did you reject it? He was upset, and he will go tell his brother what God had told him. And so the nature of Abel's sacrifice first. Secondly, the basis of Abel's sacrifice. Let's think further about the basis of, of Abel's sacrifice. I want to prove to you this morning that Cain and Abel knew of God's requirement for a blood atonement. And some of you have study Bibles and that say it wasn't revealed to that point. They're wrong. Remember, the notes are not inspired in the study Bibles. Only God inspired the scripture. So you need to read those carefully. You say, well, how can you be so sure that the principle of a blood atonement is in view and not the quality of the sacrifice or the origin of the sacrifice? Well, I'm going to give you four scriptures that definitively prove this, all right? So you might want to jot them down. Jot down Genesis 3 and verse 21. Now, if you study Genesis chapters 2 and 3 carefully, you discover that Adam and Eve... Adam and Eve had basically three kinds of covering. Before the fall, they had some kind of covering. You say, what was it? I'm not exactly sure. I wouldn't be dogmatic. But certainly we know in Psalm 104 and verse 2, when there are theophanies of God, the psalmist will write, you are clothed with splendor and majesty, covering yourself with light as with a cloak. And of course, before the fall in Genesis 2.25, we learn that the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. And so they had no sense of their nakedness and perhaps like God, since they're made in his image, that they had a cloak of light. In either case, when sin enters into the world, all of a sudden, they become sin-centered, they become self-conscious and they become aware of their nakedness. We read in Genesis 3, 7, then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew for the first time, they knew they were naked. And so what did they do? They sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. So prior to the fall, they did not know they were naked, but now they're aware of their nakedness. So what does God do? He probes them with questions. And of course, whenever God asks a question as an omniscient God, it's never to learn, it's only to reveal. So he says in Genesis 3.11, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? And so like Cain, they try to cover their guilt with the work of their own hands. They sew fig leaves together, and man does the same thing today. We try to make ourselves acceptable to God through our education, through our culture, through our religious activity that we uh, may try to express. It's fig leaf religion. But God had already revealed that fig leaf religion can never satisfy him because he declared in Genesis 2 and verse 17, the day you eat from the tree, you shall surely die. That justice demands death. And if justice demands death, then nothing short of death 
can satisfy justice. So what does God do? God comes to um, Adam and Eve in his grace. We read in Genesis 3.21, and the Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothe them. So God moves in. He takes away the fig leaf covering that pre- presents their works, and he cleanses them. He's underscoring a principle that has already been highlighted in the Proto-Evangelium, what we call the first gospel from the Latin Bible, Genesis 3.15. The first time the gospel is presented, I did a Christmas sermon one year, the first Christmas sermon, and most folks thought I was going to go to Matthew 1. My text was Genesis 3.15. It's the first time Christmas is mentioned. And God in kernel form makes a prediction about the coming Messiah that he's going to begin to unfold through Genesis all the way through Malachi. And so God gives them coats of skins. He kills animals. It's in the plural. Not one animal, but a multiplicity of animals. And the first death in all the universe now happens by the hand of God himself. Man had already died physically. He began to age. He had died spiritually on the inside. But in the realm of creation, the first death begins to happen. And God is underscoring the truth of Genesis 3 that without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness. Now, do you think Cain and Abel knew that? Of course they did. How did they know it? Their parents no doubt taught them. In fact, look at Genesis 4 and verse 3. So it came about in the course of time that Cain brought an offering to the Lord. Now, if you have the New American Standard with marginal notes, if you come to meet the pastor, you'll be gifted a Bible. You'll see the literal reading of the Hebrew. Look out in the margin. It's not there for your entertainment. It's there for your edification. It's a little wooden, but it's helpful. So it came about at the end of days. That's a Hebrewism for another way of saying at the end of the week. Some English Bibles render it at the designated time. And of course, the end of the Hebrew week was Saturday. Saturday, Genesis 2, 3, was the day that God had sanctified, that God had set apart, and he had blessed as the day of worship. So it seems reasonable to assume that if God had already established the day on which man should worship, that he would establish how they should worship. And so you may be thinking, well, do you think, again, he explained that to Adam and Eve? I know that precisely that he did, and I want to give you some additional scripture to underscore it. But let me just make a couple comments here. This family had known by what God did when he gave them coats of skin, without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness for sin. Again, some of you think you're reading into the text. No, I'm going to give you some verses that definitively, absolutely show that it's impossible to take it any other way. Jot down this text, Acts 10 and verse 43. Acts 10 and verse 43. Peter is preaching to the first Gentiles, to Cornelius, or more precisely to Cornelius and his relatives and friends. And Peter is sharing the plan of salvation, which results in the very first Gentiles ever being saved. Let me pick it up in Acts 10 and verse 39. Peter says, and we are witnesses of all the things he did, both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, And they also put him, Jesus, to death by hanging him on a cross. God raised him up on the third day and granted that he should become visible, not to all the people, but to witnesses who are chosen beforehand by God. That is to us who ate and drank with him after he arose from the dead. And he ordered us to preach to the people and solemnly to testify that this is the one who has been appointed by God as judge of the living and the dead. Of him, of Jesus, all the prophets bear witness that through his name, everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins. Now underscore in your mind that word all in Acts 10 in verse 43. All of the Old Testament prophets believed that forgiveness of sin came through the Messiah. All of them bear witness that there's one simple message. Believe in the coming Messiah and you will be forgiven. Believe in his coming blood atonement and you will be forgiven. You say, well, what does that have to do with Abel? Everything. Because Abel was a prophet. Jot down this scripture. Luke 11, 50 and 51. Luke 11, 50 and 51. It's also found in Matthew chapter 23. And Jesus is giving a very hot sermon 
to a number of unbelieving, hypocritical scribes and Pharisees, and he's talking about the prophets for whom they and their forefathers murdered for preaching the truth. Listen to these words, Luke 11. Let me pick it up in verse 47. Woe to you, for you build the tombs of the prophets. Matthew says they decorated them, and it was your fathers who killed them. Consequently, you are witnesses and approve the deeds of your fathers because it was they who killed them and you build their tombs. For this reason also the wisdom of God said, I will send to them prophets and apostles and some of them they will kill and some they will persuade, persecute. In order, watch this, in order that the blood of all the prophets shed since the foundation of the world may be charged against this generation. From the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah who perished between the altar and the house of God, yes, I tell you, it shall be charged against this generation. So I learned something in Jesus' words, some divine commentary that the Jews obviously believed, but it had not yet been recorded. And Jesus speaks it, and sometimes some oral traditions become authenticated as truth. Jesus teaches us something we learn nowhere in the Old Testament, that Abel was a prophet. From the prophet Abel to the prophet Zechariah, Matthew qualifies the son of Bechariah, the one who wrote the book of Zechariah who comes at the old, end of the Old Testament age. From Abel to Zechariah, you were involved like your fathers in the murder of the prophets. You say, well, why is it important to know that Abel is a prophet? Because of what we just read by Peter, of him, of Jesus. All the prophets, that includes Abel. All the prophets bear witness that through his name, everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins. You say, well, did he believe in the necessity of a blood sacrifice? He was one of the prophets. He preached it. What had God revealed up until this point concerning the quality of his sacrifice? Zero. What did God reveal up to this point concerning the origin of the sacrifice? Zero. What had God revealed? The only thing God had revealed was the need for blood, that fig leaf religion will not work without the shedding of blood. There is no forgiveness. And the scripture affirms that every prophet, including Abel, understood that and preached it. Now, Abel didn't know his name would be Yeshua, or in English, Jesus, but his faith was in the Messiah who would come. He was saved by his faith in the coming substitutionary atonement of the Messiah who would give his blood on a cross. And so we read in Hebrews 11, don't lose Genesis. By faith, Abel offered to God a better sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained the testimony that he was righteous. God testifying about his gifts. It was because of his faith that God had revealed that he could say that he offered a better sacrifice than Cain. Question, where did he get his faith? He got his faith the same place everyone gets their faith. Faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of God. Now certainly God had spoken through the creation and that's why, unlike the foolish apologists of our day who spend so much time trying to convince people of the existence of God, you don't find that in the New Testament except in a broad way in which it reveals how every man knows there's a God. Yes, they knew there was a God, but he knew more than that. He knew that God could not be pleased without the shedding of blood. And so, unlike the people of today who say, well, you know, name it, claim it. You know, these prosperity theologians like Joyce Meyer or T.D. Jakes or, or Benny Hinn or, or Joel Olstein. They're prosperity ripoff artists. They're in there to line their wallets and to rob innocent, naive people of their wealth, promising things that God never says. Listen, you cannot name it and claim it. The truth of the matter is you cannot claim it until God names it. You cannot believe something until God has spoken it. And in Abel's day, though the Bible had not yet been written, God, 
through direct encounters, gave revelation. He either learned this principle directly from Adam and Eve. He may have had it confirmed further as a prophet of God through a direct encounter with the Lord. In either case, he knew that it had nothing to do with the origin of the sacrifice. He knew it had nothing to do with the quality of the sacrifice, except that you don't bring your second best to the Lord. He knew it had everything to do with the kind of sacrifice. And so garments of skin were needed. And so by faith, he preached Christ, and though he is dead, the Bible says, he still speaks. Now, as for you to have faith, you have to hear what God has said. And God has plainly taught all the way through Scripture, there's a river of blood, there's a scarlet thread that begins in Genesis, goes all the way through Malachi, 400 years later, picks up in Matthew and goes all the way through Revelation, that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. And so you can easily spot true Christianity from false Christianity based on their view of the blood. And listen, there are churches all across this state and all across this country that deny the significance of the blood of Christ. You either come based on your works or you come on the basis of a blood atonement. So there was the basis of faith. There was the nature of Abel's sacrifice. There was the basis of his sacrifice, uh, Abel's sacrifice. Third, there's the faith of Abel's sacrifice. So in addition to the nature and the basis, there's the faith of Abel's sacrifice. Now let me read further again into Hebrews 11. By faith, Abel offered to God a better sacrifice. Though I certainly would not agree with those people who say it had nothing to do with blood, it just had something to do with origin or quality. While I do not believe that, it still raises an important issue that there was an issue of faith. There was an issue of faith. Suppose, again, for the sake of argument, Cain brought a blood offering, but he didn't believe that it could somehow provide through the coming Messiah forgiveness of sin then it would have just been religious activity. It would have been meaningless. But Abel believed what God had revealed, and that's why he did what he did. A blood sacrifice for Abel in faith is what baptism is to the Christian faith. In the last service, when we put someone on under the water and up again, they were by faith symbolizing that their trust was in Jesus who shed his blood, was buried, and was raised from the dead. And so we learn what Abel sacrificed in faith. Secondly, I want us to consider what Abel secured by faith. Not only what he sacrificed by faith, but what he secured by faith. So here the issue is not the worship of a false god. Cain was worshiping the one true God, but he was worshiping the one true God in a wrong way. And I want you to see that. Look again in Hebrews 11 in verse four. By faith, Abel offered to God a better sacrifice than Cain through which he obtained the testimony that he was righteous, God testifying about his gifts. A man asked me once, I was in his home, he said, Pastor, how good does someone really have to be to go to heaven? And I said, that's a profound question. You must be as perfect and as righteous as God Almighty. He said, well, wait a minute, you just said we're all sinners. That counts me out. And I said, well, This is a righteousness, therefore, that you cannot earn or merit because we are sinners. So you need to be gifted this righteousness. And so why did Jesus in the parallel account in Matthew 23 refer to Abel as righteous Abel? Well, let me underscore three reasons. Number one, Abel in faith admitted his bankruptcy. Abel in faith admitted his bankruptcy. So when Abel did what God had revealed, he acknowledged his sinfulness. But Cain did not. Cain brought the works of his hands. And when people bring today the works of their hands, they're denying what God says about them. I'm not all that bad. In fact, I can make up for any badness I have by the goodness that I do. And it's not an acknowledgement that you are bankrupt, that all of your righteous deeds, so to speak, are as filthy rags in God's sight. You can't be good enough. And so when for so many years, I didn't deny that Christ died. I was just taught it wasn't enough. I was taught, well, you believe in Jesus who died and was raised, but you also believe in your good works to help get you into heaven. And that's why in Roman Catholicism, a false religion, 
Though there are born-again Catholics who their, their study of Scripture have come to faith, but it is a false religion because it denies the sufficiency of Christ's cross. It denied it at the Council of Trent, which was their response to the Protestant Reformation. It denied it in Vatican I. It denied it in Vatican II. It denied it in 2010 at the Council of, uh, of, of Cardinals that you are not saved by grace alone through faith alone. I beg to differ. You see, when I said part of the reason you should let me in, I was basically saying because I'm a good guy. And Jesus said there is no one good but God alone. Listen to what Paul will say in Romans 4, 4 and 5. This fall we're going to do, God willing, the next handout in the basic discipleship course and I'm going to give you 100 passages of scripture you should know. And these are two verses that are non-negotiable. Now to the one who works his wage is not reckoned as a favor but what's due. It's, it's an obligation. It's the Greek word afoletes. It, it's something they owe you. You work hard at the end of the week. You're paycheck is not a favor, it's due to you. But to the one who does not work but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is reckoned, it's counted, it's imputed to him as righteousness. The one God imputes, gifts his righteousness to, sees himself the way God sees him, as ungodly. He sees that he cannot work and merit this salvation. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. He said, I didn't come to save the righteous, in air quotes. He came to call sinners to repentance. So Abel first admitted his bankruptcy. Secondly, Abel in faith believed in the Lord. He believed in the Lord. Please understand, Cain believed that there was only one true God, but he thought you could worship the one true God as he thought. He didn't bring what God required. And so like many people today, while he believed a lot of truth about God, he did not believe in the Lord. He had the same knowledge, the same requirements that had been given to Adam and Eve and to these two boys, but in effect, he didn't believe it. And so Cain basically was saying, look, Lord, I want you to have what I'm bringing. It's my best. Take it. Be pleased with it. But God was not pleased. Why? Because he did not come by faith. Faith is based on the revealed will of God. And God had taught you're saved by grace through faith. The death of Christ was not for some people. It is wrong. I think it slanders the character of God to say that Jesus did not die for all, that his atonement was limited, that it was for a particular group of people only. And so you will hear people in the Reformed faith today who also deny that God still has a plan for Israel. And they'll say, well, Christ died for those who'd repent and believe. What they're saying is he didn't die for everyone, just for those who will repent and believe. To me, that is a slander on the character of God. Paul's argument in Romans 5 is that just as through Adam death spread to all men, even so through the one act of Christ, salvation was potentially provided for all men on the cross. Peter will say when he describes apostasy that the apostates deny the master who purchased them. Wait a minute, they're unbelievers who are destined for hell, Peter said, but nonetheless they were purchased with the same blood. And so while the blood of Christ is sufficient to save anyone, it only becomes efficient for you when you come by faith. And so you either come through the religion of Cain or you come through the religion of Calvary. You either come on salvation by works or you come salvation by grace. There's no in between. And I know sometimes I have been accused over the years of preaching a barbaric message by preaching the blood of the cross, but I can preach nothing else but the preciousness of Christ's blood as the way of salvation. So here's Abel. He admitted his bankruptcy. Abel believed what God had revealed. And third, on your outline, C, Abel in faith was declared righteous. He was declared righteous. To go to heaven, you have to be as righteous as God himself. And this is a righteousness that is not earned or merited. It is gifted. It's a perfection that God wants to gift you on the basis of his undeserved favor. Listen to what Paul will write in Philippians chapter three. He says that he could testify, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. 
In other words, you need a righteousness that you cannot earn or merit. If it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. This is a righteousness that you do not achieve. It comes from God through faith. Most of you have Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 memorized. For by grace, grace is for God so loved the world because he didn't have to do that. He only owed, owed, owed us justice. For by grace, you've been saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It, this whole by grace through faith process is the gift of God, not as a result of works, not of the religion of Cain, so no one can boast. Let him who boasts, boast in the Lord, Paul will say. So you have to trust Christ's blood is sufficient to save you. You must come in faith. One final truth and I'll be done. Not only do we want to consider what he secured, in, sacrificed in faith and what he secured by faith, let's further consider what Abel speaks through faith, what he speaks through faith. And what's so fascinating about this man, Abel, is that he's still preaching today. That's plainly stated here at the end of Hebrews 11 and verse four. And through faith, though he is dead, he still speaks. The faith of Abel is still speaking a message some 6,000 years later. Yes, I believe the creation is 6,000 years old as someone asked me on the Bible line this week. Now, God doesn't say that specifically in Scripture. Suppose uh, when Moses wrote, he said, well, the creation is 2,000 years old. The day he wrote it, it would have been a year later outdated. If I asked you how old you are and you said, I'm 55, in next year when you're 56, it would be outdated, your statement. So God is wise enough not to do that. So what does he do? He gives us the birth certificate. And he shows through the genealogy of Genesis 5 and Genesis 11 that there's 2,000 years between Abel and Abraham. And there's another 2,000 years from Abraham to Christ. And now another 2,000 years that this creation is approximately 6,000 years old. And any apologist who calls himself a Christian and believes in an old earth is worthless. He is denying the plain revelation of Scripture. He's reading science into the Scripture. And God, when he speaks scientifically, speaks with absolute authority. But understand, these who say the universe is 14 billion years old and the earth is 4 billion years old, uh, 14 billion years old and the earth 4 billion years old, they want to do that because they need death before sin enters into the world. A young lady called in the Bible line two weeks ago. She said, how is it possible that Adam lived after dinosaurs? He didn't. They were created on the same day. You go to Leakey, Texas, as I shared with her. 11 years old, bright little girl, but obviously not in a sound church. And I said, there is human footprints right next to dinosaur footprints. You see, the devil wants you to believe this is billions of years old because he wants you to believe there's a great distance between the creation of the world and accountability to God. But there's not. And so for 1,900 years, 1,800 years almost exclusively, but 1,900 years of church history, no one believed in an old earth. But now we're smarter than God. And we think we're brighter than all the Protestant reformers and all the church fathers and all the Jewish writings who taught that this world is some 6,000 years old. And so Tim Keller did us a great disservice because he put death before the fall, but death came into the world, Paul says in Romans 5, through sin. There was no death before sin came into the world. And so some 6,000 years ago, Abel did what God had plainly revealed, and that's what you should plainly believe. And he still speaks to this day. You say, well, wait a minute, Pastor. Abel never wrote a book that bears his name. How does he preach today? Well, the text says he still preaches. Well, what does he preach? Let me give you at least three truths that he preaches. Number one, Abel preaches that false religion is deadly. He preaches that false religion is deadly. Back here in Genesis, I hope you didn't lose it, when Cain's offering was not accepted by God, we learn in Genesis 4 and in verse 5 that Cain became very angry. Why? Because he expected it would be accepted. Cain became very angry and his countenance fell. His face, his countenance, which is a reflection of his soul, 
It fell, and so what does God do? God moves in in all of his love and his justice because he cares about Cain. Then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your countenance fallen? If you do well, will not your countenance be lifted up? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door, and it's desires for you, but you must master it. God, in essence, is saying, no, I don't receive your offering. You are rejecting what I have said, but there's a way out, Cain. You can still come by faith, and if you will come by faith, I will receive you. But if you ignore this, sin is crouching at the door like a beast that's going to jump on you. But unfortunately, Cain did not believe God's counsel. In verse 8 of Genesis 4, and Cain told Abel, his brother, about the conversation he had with Yahweh. And it came about when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and killed him. Do you know that false religion is one of the meanest, ugliest things on this planet? Most of the wars in human history, most of the conflicts have been rooted in religion. False religion is hateful, it is deadly, and as we approach the end of the age, it's going to become more deadly, especially during the time of the Great Tribulation, where millions of God's converted saints during that time will be beheaded. Jesus warned, an hour is coming for everyone who kills you to think that he is offering service to God. In other words, they're doing it in the name of religion. I'm serving the Lord by taking this guy's life. False religion can be deadly. Why? Because spiritually dead people produce death. Spiritually dead people produce spiritually dead churches. And spiritually dead people produce the spiritually dead religions of the world. Wherever you have spiritual death, you have the potential for deadly behavior, death-like responses. John, in 1 John 3, in verse 15, he is comparing false Christians from true Christians. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life. In other words, he's saying within the church, you've got these false teachers. These things I'm writing to you who believe in the name of the Son of God in order that you may know that you have eternal life. He wants to underscore, unlike the false teaching, what are the marks of a real believer? He's not writing to people who doubted salvation. He's writing to people who, some of whom had a false assurance of salvation based on what the pre-Gnostics were teaching. Oh, it's okay to live immorally because your body is not important, just your spirit is. And so he compares those who practice righteousness with those who don't, those who love their brother and those who hate their brother. And everyone who hates his brother, he has the mark of an unbeliever. He's like a murderer. And sometimes that death-like hate can actually act itself out in literal murder. And so we see that when Cain takes his brother. Understand there's a lot that's been done in the name of Christianity, not by done by true Christians. As I address some of my orthodox rabbinical friends who I have dinner with on a number of occasions over these past seven years, I said, understand, all these programs, all these popes who slaughtered your people, everything that's been done in the name of Christianity has not been done by true Christians. So false religion is deadly. Secondly, Abel preaches that false religion is deceptive. It's deceptive. In verse 9 of Genesis 4, then the Lord said to Cain, where is Abel your brother? And he said, I do not know. Am I my my brother's keeper? What do you mean you don't know? He's right out there in the field where you left him. And his blood is shouting to me up here in heaven. What have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. But Cain lies. That's because that's what false religion does. People who are involved in false religion are either A, deceived, but for the most part, they are deceivers. And so he deceived himself into thinking that the revelation that God had given without the shedding of blood was not all that important and that God could take his sacrifice. And here's God still reaching out to him. Am I my brother's keeper? Yes, you are. And look what you did with your own earthly brother. And so God uh, is reaching out to him. And of course, he he describes him in, in terms as a vagrant and so forth on the earth. Why does God give him a mark that he has to wear the rest of his life? It has nothing to do with someone becoming black. There are no races until after 
the great flood in the Tower of Babel, but he in his unbelief raises up a prodigy of people who do continual evil, and it becomes the reason for the great flood. And so there are people out there who lie. They lie to themselves. They lie to other people that what they believe is just fine. And they're lying to God and about God because God has spoken and they are saying that what God has said is not true. The Bible can't be trusted. It's full of errors. It's not authoritative. It's been translated so many times. It can't be trusted. And they come up with all these faulty arguments. Why? Because they're a member of another kingdom, Satan's kingdom, who is a liar and the father of lies. So it is deceptive. Finally, false religion is destructive. It's destructive because it invites the judgment of God. You cannot break the laws of God and not be broken by them. You cannot reject the revelation of God and and evade the consequences. There are always consequences to sin. And the worst consequence is the ruin that you bring in your life. Many, many people, but by God's grace, there go I. They say, I wish I had received Jesus 20 years ago or 30 years ago. My life has been so shattered by the decisions that I've made. Thank God today can be the first day of the rest of your life. But the worst destruction is an eternal destruction when a person is forever lost. And of course, we read here in verse 11 of Genesis, and now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you cultivate the ground, it shall no longer yield its strength to you. You shall be a vagrant, and a wanderer on the earth. He's telling him now, it's not going to produce the kind of fruit you'd seen in the past through the sweat of your brow. You can work your tail off, but it's not going to produce it. Why? You, because I'm not going to let it. You're going to be a vagrant and a wanderer. What is God doing? He's still reaching out to this man. He wants him to know that he can still be forgiven. But when God gives a final commentary on his life in the New Testament, we read this. 1 John 3, For this is the message which you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Not as Cain, here it is, who was of the evil one and slew his brother. And for that reason, and for what reason did he slay him? Because his deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. Because Abel came in faith, which produced righteous deeds. And Cain came in unbelief that produced unrighteous deeds. Yes, even murder and a prodigy of evil people that bring the great flood. He was of the evil one. You're not saved by works. You're saved by grace alone. John underscores that all the way through his first epistle. But the grace that saves is never alone. And he had no evidence that he had been born from above, to put it in New Testament terminology. And so here is Abel, and through faith, though he is dead, he still speaks. Now, some of you, I know you met the Lord. I don't doubt that. You're saying, well, I'm saved. How does he speak to me? Let me give you three expressions of how he's speaking today. Number one, he is underscoring by what he did, that the blood atonement is the principal source of persecution. The blood atonement is the principal source of persecution. You know, we tend in our day to have a very superficial view of Christianity. We have these so-called pastors who say, just come to Jesus and, you know, you'll be rich, you'll be wealthy, you'll be healthy, and all your problems will go away. It may sound inviting, and it may line their pockets, but it's certainly not biblical. Paul argues in Galatians 5 and verse 11, the reason he is being persecuted is because he's preaching a bloody cross that salvation is by grace alone through faith alone. And so Abel responded to the revelation of God, and what happened to him? He was murdered. The first murderer was of a righteous man. Why? Because Cain found the message to be offensive. And you leave out a bloody cross and you won't really offend many people. You preach the blood of the cross and a substitutionary atonement and there will be people who do not like you. Secondly, this passage reminds me that the blood atonement was not some emergency measure. 
The blood atonement is not an emergency measure. Jesus dying on a bloody cross was not some afterthought in the plan and mind of God. The Bible says in the Revelation chapter 13 that he was crucified in the mind and heart of God before the foundations of the world. Do you know what that means? It means that our omniscient God who made man as a totally free moral agent, knowing what man and you did and I did because we're not simply victims of Adam, we're participants with Adam. In Adam all die, we sinned in and with Adam, Romans 5, 12, but God knew, God knew that he would make a provision in his grace through a blood atonement. You know, many of the hymnals during the 1980s, all of a sudden, all the hymns that dealt with the blood of Christ were removed because people were saying they were too offensive. And you can't sell hymnals if you have offensive hymns in it. But listen, if we are ashamed to speak of the blood of Christ, we might as well just close our doors and go home because we have nothing to say. Third, the blood atonement is the only way to be forgiven. Understand, Abel was already a believer in the Lord, and he came on this particular day to worship the living God, just like you may be saved, and you need cleansing, and the Bible reminds us even of saved believers, the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, his blood cleanses us. And if you've met Jesus in salvation, understand it's not your participation in church, though you should be here in obedience to Christ's word. It's not your giving of money. It's not your Bible memory or Bible study or serving people that somehow provides for a way of cleansing from guilt. Nothing can cleanse us but the blood of Christ. Now, I have no doubt I am speaking to some people probably in this room, live streaming, maybe in our other auditoriums who've never been saved. You don't have the assurance that if this were your last day upon the earth that heaven is absolutely your home. You say, I hope it will be, I think it will, but I can't say for sure. I spoke to many people yesterday, visitors, no assurance. You can be sure because salvation is not merited, it is gifted. You must come in humility. When Paul speaks to the Corinthian church and he preaches about the cross, he said to some, to the religious people, it would be a stumbling block. To other folks, it would be foolishness. But he said to those who believe, it is the power of God for salvation. Is this foolishness to you? If you believe that there's a Savior who came, who died, and was raised... It is the power of God for your soul. Now, Holy Father, we thank you today for the precious blood of Christ. Father, I thank you. I've made peace through the blood of the cross. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and his righteousness. And I thank you for that. And I know, Father, there are people listening who need to be saved. And I pray that they would recognize that today is the day of salvation. We think of Cain who habitually put it off. And today you have forever put in stone that he is of the evil one. Help someone to say in simple childlike faith, Lord Jesus, I thank you that you died for me in my place. You took all of the punishment and with your precious blood you provided a way of escape Lord Jesus I ask you right now and forever to save me say it mean it believe it knowing God cannot lie Lord Jesus save me and because you saved me I'll make it public not to be saved but because I'm saved I'll make it public Father there are others here who have been saved but they are living under the guilt of sin. And thank you that when we confess our sin, you are both faithful and righteous to forgive us and to cleanse us. That the blood of Christ cleanses us from all sin. 
Help someone today to walk in the freshness and the joy of the salvation that you have provided. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand? We'll sing a hymn of invitation. You're here. You've received Christ. You've never made it public. I want to give you that opportunity. Maybe you've been saved, but you haven't been baptized. Symbolic of your faith in the death and resurrection, I want to invite you to come. You say, I've been saved and baptized, Pastor. Do you have a church home? You know, I talked to someone. They said, I came from a church in California. There's no membership. I said, that's pathetic. The New Testament teaches the concept of biblical membership. That you are willing to join with people of like mind. And if we can be that church for you, I want to invite you to come. Matt, lead us. If you have a decision to make, I invite you to step out now and meet me here in the front.